Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Virtual Door Knocking 2020. I'm excited this morning, and I'm very honored to have this special guest on with us today. And his name is Joshua Freed. He is running for lieutenant governor. Welcome to Virtual Door Knocking 2020. Thank you, Regis. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for... Uh, coming down and uh, spending a little time with us. And uh, we're going to just dive right in because time is of the essence. And uh, we certainly want to make sure that we give you all the time available to talk about all the things that you're into, etc. Let's start up, introduce you to the audience. And let's, you know, ask the question, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Sounds good. Well, it's uh, it's always good to be able to get together and talk about the things of the day in Washington State. I've Absolutely. lived here for 47 years. I was born in Kirkland at Evergreen Hospital, which sadly was the kind of the hotbed of the COVID crisis mm -hmm. in Washington State for a long period of time. But my parents bought a farm about three weeks before I was born. So after that, they brought me back home to Bothell. And most of my life, I've lived there for basically 47 years, except I lived in Egypt for a period of time. And then Pakistan for a period of oh, time wow. as well, but went to Seattle Pacific University, met my wife, Lindy, there, and so we've been married for 23 years, and we have five kids, Caleb, Emily, Janie, Simon, and Levi, from 22 years old down to twin boys that are 14. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That, <laughs> that's a lot with the twins and everything. Tell me a little bit about the time... Um, you, you spent in Egypt. That that sounds very interesting. It was fun. I mean, I was three to seven, but I understand, understood Arabic, no problem at all. I would be able to go throughout the streets, had a lot of freedom, strangely enough. My mom was a nurse, and she's always been a nurse throughout her career. My dad was actually the high school uh, principal of the American school, or in, international school there at the time. And then my time in Pakistan, he worked for USAID, which is the Agency for International Development. My mom was still a nurse and working at the embassy. So Wild times living in the Middle East. Car bombs, anti-American oh, riots, wow. yeah. missiles hitting my school. It's like nothing you've ever seen. So. Well, you, you, you've got all of your limbs, all the digits. Oh, so, all this yeah. working. Exactly. That's <laughs> great. So today we want to talk about um, a little bit about your platform. I know you're running for lieutenant governor. That's um, right. Congratulations in advance. Sure. I'm um, just going to put that out there in existence. Um, but let's talk about your platform. Talk about you know some of the initiatives that um, you are um, very passionate about. Mm -hmm. And uh, let the audience know, you know, hey, you know, why vote for Joshua Freed? Absolutely. Well, I'm one my parents taught me to be involved. If you see something going on, be part of the solution. So many years ago, I got involved with the Republican Party 25 years ago, becoming a PCO and area chair and the vice chair of the first legislative district and then chairman. And then about 15 years ago, I ran for Bothell City Council and actually ran three different times and served for three terms in the city of Bothell. And I was mayor for the period of time of the largest redevelopment of a, a town in Washington state. We brought in about $450 million worth of private investment. And through that, I also started Initiative 27 in King County to fight government-run heroin injections sites because right now we're seeing this movement from the leadership of Seattle and King County to enable drug users in their mm -hmm. addictions, ultimately opening up these facilities where people come in, they get their tourniquet, they get the syringes, the needles, the pan to cook the heroin in, and even the matches. So clearly as somebody who values human life, I said, this is the wrong direction. So my wife and I got I-27 started and got 20 different jurisdictions to put bans on heroin injection sites. That included all of Snohomish County, all of Pierce County, and 18 different cities in King County. But during that process of really being exposed to what's going on the streets of Seattle and across the state of Washington, um, we decided to run for governor. So I uh, put my hat in the ring about a year ago and ran a campaign. 36 of us ended up jumping in this race, and I came in third place. So on the day after uh, the primary, I got a call from the Washington State Republican Party saying, hey, we think you should consider a run for lieutenant governor as a write-in candidate. And to explain to the listeners, we are top two state here in Washington State, meaning uh, the top two vote-getters move from the primary to the mm -hmm. general. So in this case, two Democrats won in the position of lieutenant governor. One is Denny Heck, who's like voting for Nancy Pelosi. The other is uh, Marco Leas, is like voting for AOC. So in my mind, clearly no choice at all. So now filing as a write-in candidate and working to get the support of Republicans or independents across the state of Washington, anyone looking for an alternative to these two very liberal Democrats just need to go down on their ballot to lieutenant governor, fill in the little bubble, and write on the line Joshua Freed. 
and really, why am I running? What is the platform? It's very consistent with uh, what I've been talking about through all 39 counties in Washington state this year. The lieutenant governor is over trade and economic development, and we've seen our economy be killed here in Washington state. It's not COVID, it's Jay Inslee. And so what I would like to focus on, on the leader of trade and economic development is Mm -hmm. open up these trade routes around the world. And I have a lot of experience in different markets around the world. We do a lot of ministry in the Philippines every year, in Kenya, leading trips to Israel, been to 48 countries in the world, unless you consider Chaz a different country, then it would be 49, because I spent an hour (laughs) down there. Um, So if our government is wanting to shut down our economy again, I will be able to create these trade routes for businesses, manufacturers, producers in Washington state to still sell their products around the world. I mean, maybe not a lot of people know, but we are not competitive even in agriculture anymore. We used to export billions of dollars. We've seen a 27% decrease in exports in Washington state after the last four years. Another role of Lieutenant Governor is overseeing the addiction programs in Washington state. And as I mentioned, you know, my concern about heroin injection sites, I'm seeing as the drug culture increases in Washington state, so is homelessness. And right now we're not having the resolve to properly treat what we're seeing in, on the streets around us, where people are living in lawless lifestyles. They are breaking into people's homes. They're assaulting people on the streets. We've seen murder under the last four years increase by 45%. Rape is up by 65%. There's no longer this respect for human life around you. You've People have become to dehumanize others. And really, as Republicans, as the party of life, I certainly am pro-life, but also I'm concerned about these people that are currently addicted to drugs and alcohol on this pathway to suicide. And then another key role of lieutenant governor is to be the president of the Senate. And this last year, we saw Senate Bill 5395 move forward, which is comprehensive sex education moved from the Senate to the House and passed at 2.30 in the morning. And really, this is the compromising Mm -hmm. of the young, innocent minds, five- and six-year-old kids with this most grotesque-type material. And so I called my campaign consultant and my attorney and said, hey, I want to start a referendum. So we started Referendum 90, brought in groups like HROC, which is the House Republican Organizational Committee, and then this network of support across the state of Washington came together. It's been extraordinary. So Mindy Wirth is our uh, lead spokesperson for R90, but so many other groups have now taken ownership of this, which is wonderful, because collectively, we have to work together. Oh, yeah, most definitely. You mentioned uh, the Referendum 90, the R90. Let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean to me, to you, um, to our listening audience? They may not be acquainted with R90. So if you can explain to them what that means, that'll uh, obviously help us when we go to cast our ballots regarding that referendum. Absolutely. So our state constitution allows for a referendum of the people to shut down bad decisions that the legislature has made. So clearly compromising the minds of five, six, seven-year-old kids with comprehensive sex education, this is a mandate of all the school districts in Washington state must teach comprehensive sex, 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 sex education at all different levels. And when you see the curriculum that's being pushed forward, it will just blow your mind. It's literally pornographic for these mm. young children. And so we went through this signature collecting phase. We need to collect around 130,000 signatures. Actually, across the state, 266,000 signatures were gathered to put R90 on the ballot. So for some people, this is where the confusing part comes in. We work so hard to put R90 on the ballot this November, but now we need to do all we can to reject R90. By rejecting R90, we're rejecting comprehensive sex education. And Again, why do we reject them? We reject the bad decisions that were made down in Olympia because we want to make sure that our young, innocent kids are kept safe. You know, it's all part of the agenda today. Compromise these minds of five, six-year-old kids, let Planned Parenthood be the health alternative in the middle school, and then let 13-year-old girls get abortions without parents knowing it. We are falling further further behind in Washington state, going deeper and darker, uh, not protecting our kids. That's caused so much division, uh, separation, death, destruction in Washington. We cannot continue on this uh, trajectory or else we're not going to get back. No, totally agree with you. I was reading this uh, R90 um, information and uh, I was appalled that they would kind of ramrod, if you will, things down our throat in reference to, like you said, five, six, and seven, the innocent. I mean, do you really believe that a child of that age should be introduced 
to that form of education, sex education, that comprehensive at that age. And and really, I can remember when I was growing up, I mean, sex education, you know, was all about, hey, you're having a child and this, that and the other. And you didn't get introduced to that till you were 14, 15, 16 years old, and sometimes even later, right. um, depending on, you know, your school district and all that other good stuff. But now it, it seems like there is an agenda. Hmm. And I don't know where this is all stemming from. Um that they're trying to just force all of this stuff on our kids and then take the parents out of it, take the school board out of it, take people with, you know, rational decision making process out of the loop and then just, yep, this this is where we're going. This is what you have to eat. This is what you have to do. I think that, you know, I'm hoping that it, it sparks somebody out there to say, wait a minute, I didn't realize what this was all about. Let me look into this further. And and hence why we're having this conversation around this, because anytime you take a child and you subject them to this type of of, of dogma, in my, my opinion, and this type of literature and this type of comprehensive sex education, you're really taking them to a dark place, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's this their attempt to normalize promiscuity, ultimately. And there used to be innocence. <laughs> right. For sure. Yeah, used and to now be. that innocence, they're being literally pushing strong to try to push these images in these kids' minds. And once you push those images in those kids' minds, they're not going to retreat. What happened to the day where you go to kindergarten, first grade, you'd be drawing and learning ABCs. You know, this is the first time in state history where the office of OSPI, the Office Mm -hmm. of Superintendent Superintendent. Public Instruction, is mandating a curriculum is taught in all 294 school districts. So you would have thought, well, we mandate that math must be taught, we mandate that science must be taught, we mandate these different subjects. No, now comprehensive sex education must be taught in all. And what's so interesting, if you watch that 2.30 in the morning, that discussion on the House floor, uh, a Republican legislator made an amendment and saying, we want to let the kids opt out of this curriculum. And the Democrats were saying, well, no, you know, the good news is the parents can opt their kids out. But the problem is, it's not like they can say, hey, we're going to opt our kid Johnny out of seventh period because that's health class where it's taught. No, now comprehensive sex, sex education is throughout the whole curriculum throughout the whole day. So this Republican legislator said, mm. we'll let the kids opt out. The Democrat legislator stood up and said, no, these kids' minds don't develop until age 20. They wouldn't know if they should with, redraw, with, uh, withdraw themselves from that class. And your response is pro- appropriate. It was like, wait a minute. If, if, if they're not developed till 20, why are we introducing this at five, six, and seven in younger ages? So, I mean, that, that, it's a contradiction just on the premise, just with that one statement. I mean, it's like, wait a minute, who in the world is pushing this agenda? I mean, my grandchildren, and yes, I have grandchildren, I would not want them to be subjugated to, you know, being forced this type of education, which I feel they're not ready for this. I mean, I don't care what society says. You know, I want to make sure that my kids are protected in their innocence. I want them to grow in grace. And I want them to, Hmm. you know, be at an age where, you know, they feel that they're ready to receive this. And that age is way too young. It is not right. Um, And for those of you that are listening out here, hopefully you're getting a little fire under you. And hopefully you look at our, you know, future lieutenant governor and saying, hey, look, you know what? He's protecting our children's innocence. And he's going to not only do that, there's some other things that you talked about. You talked about um, being the president of the Senate over, you know, the trade and making sure the economic flow of the state of Washington, fair trade and all that stuff is happening. There's a lot of different things that you're looking to do as Mm -hmm. lieutenant governor. And, oh gosh, I'm I'm fired up about this this morning. Um, But our children, if if we get to the place in our society where we don't protect the innocency of our kids, Mm -hmm. and we're just going to just let everything go and, hey, we live in a pluralistic society and blah, blah, blah. I'm not down for that. No. No, I can see that, and I can hear that in your voice I as am well. not down I, with that. I love the passion. That's why we set a state record collecting those 266,000 signatures, double the amount that we needed. That was during a stay-at-home order. We would have been at 500, 600,000. My hope is what happened is people of conservative values are finally woken up in Washington State because there's been a lot of complacency. There's been a lot of a attitude of defeat because there's been a lie given by the Socialist Democrats of Washington State saying... You conservatives, just stay home. Your vote doesn't matter. Just 
don't even take part of the process. You've lost before, you're going to lose again. And with that, they become taught not to participate in what's going on in the civic square. And as a person of faith, sadly, I think a lot of churches believe that there's a separation of church and state. I don't believe that. No, good. Well, so many pastors believe, well, we shouldn't be there. You know, the Great Commission is Matthew 28, Acts 1, 8, to go into the world and Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I don't think that means we can go everywhere except politics. No, politics... That's everywhere. Everywhere, every corner of the earth, we're called to go to take truth. And right now, if we're not living out that call, then you can see comprehensive sex education pass at two in the morning. You can see 13-year-old girls get abortions without parents knowing it. You can see our own governor make Washington state a sanctuary state, which has now made it a hotbed for the sex trade. We have average age 12-year-old boys and girls in the sex trade in Washington state. And who do you imagine are those 13-year-old girls get abortions without their parents knowing it? I'm thinking many of them are these kids in the sex trade at 13 getting abortions and then going back right back to work. This is what's Mm. going on. This is why you have Satanists walking up and down the steps of the Capitol this year doing rituals. He is roaring like a lion seeking to devour, and he has no fear. And so we as believers need to stand up with... Uh, Joshua 1 9, have I got, not commanded exactly. to be bold and courageous, do not be afraid or dismayed, because we are called to go forward to the front lines on behalf of the children right now. If we don't, you can see what's happening. You know what? You, you couldn't have said that better. And, you know, when you look at everything, you know, I know we live in a, you know, democratic state and there's a lot of liberalism, a lot of pluralism, a lot of isms, you know, um, but we need to take back conservative. Hmm. And <laughs> and and make sure that our voices are heard, etc. You know, and I, I get it. I mean, we we we're, I believe that we are living in some of the most important times, uh, the annals of history right hmm. now. The direction of you know the United States, you know, local government, Washington State, etc. And if we do not stand up for what we believe, like you said, as believers, as faith based believers, you know what, and say, you know what, this is wrong. Yep. Who else then? Yeah. Who who else is gonna do this? Yep. Who else is gonna protect, you know, not only our jobs, but our children, our livelihood, you know, our beliefs. I can remember, and this was oh man, maybe 20, 25 years ago when when all the stuff was being passed about you know, and I'm not going to get into dogma about, you know, your sexual preference and all that other stuff, but all the stuff was passing or whatever. And um, people of faith, we kind of sat on the sidelines. Mm-hmm. And like you said, we have that mindset about, oh, no, separation church and state, you know, we should be just praising our God and, you know, blah, 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 going to church quietly or whatever. And then all these laws have been passed. And look at the state that we're in today. Because no one stood up on the conservative side and said, okay, enough is enough. Right. You know, this country was founded on uh, biblical principles, um, and we have totally gone away from those core beliefs. And I, I, and I believe individuals like yourself that have these core beliefs, that have standards, that have have, you know, uh, you know, just the rightness of mind to say, look, let's vet this out the correct way yeah. instead of just cramming it down somebody's throat. And we need to stand up for what we believe and we need to stand up for conservatism. Absolutely. I love what you're saying in your voice on this for sure. You know, sadly, so many pastors, as I said before, and so many believers aren't involved in that public square. I think about the Proverbs 31 woman who mm-hmm. are married to one. Uh, her husband was at the city gate involved in this discussion of what's going on. I believe that we are called in the public square to be involved in this. Otherwise, if we abdicate our role, you can see who's going to flood that square and where the deci- what decisions are going to be made. And I reflect back to history, maybe in the in Israel at the many years ago, you had three kings of a united kingdom there. What happened when the, after um, Solomon, Rehoboam, mm-hmm. the nation was divided into two because they stopped listening to the prophets. Ultimately, we are called prophets, meaning people of faith are supposed to speak to uh, those people in leadership. And when the people in leadership stop uh, listening or the people stop with their face, stop talking about things in the public square, things are divided. Brokenness comes. So let's let's put a little rub on this because I know that there's some people out there that may not have the conservative point of view. They may not have um, 
um, our sentiments, if you will. Sure. Um, let's put a little rub. So what would you say to those out there that say, well, hey, you know, I, I really believe in a kind of a democratic or socialist or pluralistic so- society in reference to um, everything that's going on. And I have children and I don't see anything wrong with them, you know, introducing this bill, this R90 and we pass it, et cetera. What would you say to those individuals out there and how could you possibly persuade them otherwise? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I mean, that's the thing. You have your kids, your own kids, and you can teach your own children in the way that you see fit. I am teaching my own children in the way we see fit, my wife and I. So we've taken upon us as our responsibility to teach our children about sex, right? And I don't want some teacher in class that I don't know bringing these type of materials. So you do your thing on your own, but don't mandate that your lifestyle is my lifestyle in the sense that don't teach force that my kids are taught at such a young age. I like to keep my kids innocence. I like for them to use their imagination to go in the forest and play with Play-Doh and and paint at, at age five and six. So it's so interesting because they're mandating beliefs on us. Like on positions of faith, I, um, during the stay-at-home crisis here where we were under stay-at-home order from our governor, he said that you can go to a pot shop, you can go to a liquor store to cure your anxieties, you can go to Walmart if materialism is your thing, but if the topic turns to prayer, you're not allowed to go. Churches are closed, and I brought a lawsuit in federal court that says I even want to take it down to the most minute, ridiculous level that Regus and I can sit in my front yard six to seven feet apart in our PPE material, and we just want to be able to read scripture, right? Right. And the attorney general argued in court with 156 pages, four different court documents said, no, Josh, you don't even have that right. Yet I could go on the golf course with you. We could play golf, but the topic turns to prayer that's not allowed. So I brought this federal lawsuit saying that you are infringing on our constitutional rights, whether you're Christian, whether you are Muslim, Hindu, all these people of faith in Washington state from different uh, belief patterns are being prevented from meeting with their spiritual leader. In Washington state, we have a constitution that says you have the right to do that. That's what made America so great. Exactly. Right? People were coming from Europe here because they felt there was a state church telling them what to do and what to think. No, as a person of faith, we are able to make that decision on our own without government intrusion. So in court, we got the attorney general to admit that the governor cannot and will not infringe on spiritual gatherings. So thankfully, many people of faith and different backgrounds across the state of Washington are are now meeting today. Some are not. Um, my encouragement would be to do so, because you have that constitutional right without the intrusion of government to do so. But in that same sense, the whole creation of America was to get uh, people's other belief systems out of your life and just say, no, we're going to make our own decisions in regards to faith. Exactly. But You know, what you said there, Joshua, I mean, it is so important um, that we, as people of faith, don't lose our faith hmm. um, because we see all these laws and we see all these things happening. But the only way that we are going to invoke change is that we've got to get in process. We have to be in that mode. We have to look at things from a different perspective. And I, you know, I, I know from a being a person of color in the faith mode. There is no color. We're all brothers and sisters. Mm. So I understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you What would you say? And let me let me. I'm getting ahead of myself because I wanted to uh, make this point. Um, my pastor was saying exactly the same thing. He was like, "Hey, look, you know, people go to, you know, they go to the the liquor store, they go get their pot, and they go do this and they go do that. And then when it comes to churches, there's this cloud. There's this, you know, hey, you know what? No, nope, you could you can't do this. You can't do that. Can't open up whatever. And he goes, why not? He goes, everybody else is doing what they want to do. Why can't we do what we want to do? And we're 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 not causing harm. Mm-mm. We're not driving under the influence. We're not doing all these different things, et cetera. We're not saying that we're better than anybody else. That's not what we're saying. But from a constitutional right to, you know, um, have our faith-based privileges, why not? Yeah. Why not? And so the other thing that I wanted to to get to. And I know a lot of uh, people out there may be thinking this, and um, I'll just say it, you know, for people of color, and you see some of the injustices that have been going on um, over the last 
good Lord, seems like the whole year, but over the last four or five months, what would you say to those? Because traditionally, over the last, what, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, African Americans predominantly vote d- Democratic, mm-hmm. right? What would you say to um, someone that is watching that is of, of color, people of color, um, and they're listening to you and they're like, but he's a Republican. What what would you you know what would you tell them to like you know you need to vote for me because you know I'm going to do X for people of color blah 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 what does that what does that sound like from you and how can you get them to look at things from a different perspective I appreciate well I believe that the Republican Party is the party of life and the party that encourages you to be involved in the community and truly love your neighbor the Democrat Party today has become the party of death division and destruction when you look at what happened in Capitol Hill where Jay Inslee said he was unaware what happened there was not an issue of race it was a uh, issue of lawlessness if it was an issue of racial reconciliation 67 different Asian businesses wouldn't have been broken in by violent protesters and so folks went down there. I went down to Chaz and walked around for an hour. And if you tried to share your First Amendment rights, uh, some of your own opinion, they would literally drag you out violently or shoot you where you stand. So that's why I say that socialist Democrats have become the party of death, destruction, and division. As a Republican, I reflect back to the origination of our party, Abraham Lincoln, who literally, his life was taken in the fight against slavery. And thankfully, we overcame that deep darkness. And now, um, I think about the Jim Crow laws. I think about the Civil Rights Act and many of those Mm -hmm. bills that were passed, those are voted for in greater percentages by Republicans than they were by Democrats. Republicans are ones that want to see that we have individual liberties, we have the right to be able to move forward. Um, Right now we're seeing, you know, 60% tax increases and budget increases under this current Democrat governor. And we see more division than we ever have before in the state of Washington, where he's, uh, our governor's dividing us into groups of essential versus non-essential, declaring that you can work and you must stay home. Home. This type of divisive type conversation is hurting our communities right now and pushing us further and further apart. New leadership that truly understands that we're created equal in God's eyes, that we all have equal rights, and we need to look at each other respectfully should be the intended. For me personally, some of my dearest friends are in Kenya, some of my dearest friends in the Philippines, and I look at them as Alfred or I look at them as a long. I don't look at them as something different. Like, exactly. I mean, I've been a person of color in the sense that I've lived in many different foreign countries in my life, and I was the one white guy. But I was always like, we're just friends. We're going out skateboarding together. We're going to get a milkshake. You know, that's how we need to live life. No, that's that's good points. And and for those of you uh, that are listening to this conversation, I'm, I'm hoping that you, you look at this from the right perspective. Because anytime you, you know, you get so immersed in, oh, gosh, I'm just going to believe this way – and, and not have perspective. It's just e- even in the faith-based community, I mean, granny, we all have different belief patterns, et cetera, but the Bible says, come, let us reason together. And mm-hmm. how can two walk together except they agree? And sometimes we lose those little nuggets along the way because we're standing on the side and, and we got our, you know, uh, stake in the ground. And if you cross this stake, you know what, you know what, you've offended me or this and No, 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 no. It is about perspective. But also, too, it's about making the right decisions mm. as we move forward. Because I, re- I really believe that our democracy is is teetering. It, it's in the balance. And those of us that know uh, the right way, and when I say the right way, making the right decisions for our society, where it's not I'm better than him and he's better than I, it is about us coming together to make the best possible situation for all of us so we can all thrive yeah. and, and, and work as, you know, a long shoulder to shoulder with one another. And I think that's important. So as we as we finish up, I'm going to have um, Joshua uh, just kind of just give us a, you know, a little... Uh, uh, summation about why him again. This is his infomercial time. And I really believe that uh, this conversation that we had today, it, it offers perspective. It offers different dimension about the R90. And hopefully you get a fire under you about, man, let's get fired up. Let's get in the game and let's change some of these laws that are affecting the most vulnerable in our society. Joshua, as you kind of give us a 
you know, why Joshua? A summation. <laughs> well, for sure, let's start off with reject referendum 90, therefore reject comprehensive sex education. We have to make sure we make that vote. And then when you get your ballot, go down to lieutenant governor, fill in that bubble for Joshua Freed. I am the only Republican option endorsed by the Washington State Republican Party, Pierce County, King County, Clark County, Franklin County. We have 39 beautiful counties across we, the state of Washington. Exactly. <laughs> so again, Joshua Freed, you can write J. Freed, Josh Freed. My request is you write my full name, Joshua Freed for Lieutenant Governor. With that, we can finally have somebody that will stand in the gap for us in Olympia. So I'd appreciate your vote, and you can learn more by going to joshuafreed.com. That's J-O-S-H-U-A. F R E E D, but Regis, what an amazing time! No, Thank you, I, I I really appreciate your time coming on today. Virtual door knocking 2020. Thank you to uh, BD Local for always hosting us and just being there for us. And thank you again, and much success to you in your campaign. Looking for some great things out of you. Thank you again. Tune in next time for the next uh, topic on virtual door knocking 2020. Don't forget to vote. Make your voice heard. Thank you, and take care. 